Okay, we're back in practice session and still until I press start. So once everyone's back. So Kristen. Just Katie. Okay, is that everybody? I'm gonna press start. Okay, the webinar has now started. Okay, great. Let's give it a few minutes for the <clears throat> attendees to join us. Is Jake going to be in the attendee or is he going to come in through the panelist? I sent Jake a panelist invite, but if I see him in attendees, I can promote him to panelist. Perfect. And I saw Suzanne was with us earlier, so Suzanne's here. Don't see Jake. Okay, we good to get going? I think so. Okay, the first agenda item is the um, approval of minutes for December 15th, 2021. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, nope. can I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, and I think because we're remote, we need to do a roll call vote on everything, right? So, Julia? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Matt? Aye. Kristen? Aye. And Shannon? Aye. Mm -hmm. um, the next item is public comments. Um, uh, Danielle, we need to get back to putting the public comment statement on the agenda that has dropped off the last two meetings. Um, so I need to go find it in my notes. Okay. Um, let's see. I think it's always on the agenda that is the um, one in the folder, but not the posted one. So Okay. Would you like me to read it? Do you do yeah, do you mind? Because I always I work off the posted one. Sorry. <laughs> the comments from the public section of the meeting is an opportunity for members of the community to address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative matters, or share ideas about how we can work together to improve the Duxbury Public Schools. We value your input and respect divergent views. We only ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes and refrain from airing grievances with individual members of the school community. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you guys, if attendees want to do public comment, you go into the participant list and, and um, raise your hand. And then I'll ask Dr. Klingeman to bring you over um, and just you know be kind in three minutes. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, looks like we don't have any public comment at this time in the meeting. So the next agenda item, uh, we move on to reports for the school committee with the interim superintendent, Dr. Klingeman. All right, thank you. Just a couple of announcements. Um, calendar adjustments, we wanted to alert the school committee and our community that due to the three weather days we had with the nor'easter back on October 27th, 28th, and 29th, and our most recent snow day on January 7th, our last day of school is now Thursday, June 23rd. And we wanted to just bring to your attention because this is a new um, situation that's come up where the state holiday of Juneteenth 
is now recognized as a state holiday. So we will not have school on June 20th in observance of this day. So um, there is an updated calendar in tonight's school committee folder and we have updated the calendar on the district website. And we will have a 22-23 school calendar to propose calendar to present to you at the February meeting. Um, I just wanted to report that our COVID numbers are down slightly from last week. We're hearing um, right now from other school districts that they're easing up on some of the close, uh, close contact tracing because the numbers have become unmanageable. I just wanted to share that we have not changed our close contact identification here in Duxbury, and we won't unless we receive directives from DESE that that um, will no longer be required. But the high school has modified their absent report to be more efficient to be able to more efficiently contact trace without needing to make as many phone calls, although they will still make phone calls as needed throughout the day to be able to identify close contacts. And we um, will continue to provide the five day count of positive cases on our website in the coming weeks, and we have attempted to be responsive to um, parent feedback and requests for information that has been um, sent our way. So um, we continue to hope to see a, a downshift in um, the positive cases that we've seen when we came back from break um, as January winds, winds down. That's all for me for now. Thank you. Uh Next in the reports, we have um, Intern Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Wilcox. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yesterday, we are continuing our parent workshops and yesterday was our most recent parent workshop. We had Megan Selchin and she is a consult, uh, from Puzzle Pieces. She presented on anxiety, resilience and the impact on parenting. And she provided helpful tips for parents such as meeting children where they're at, and also knowing our own triggers as parents. The presentation will be available on our district website. It's on our main page and it's under quick links, which is down on the right-hand side. And that is where our other past pre presentations are as well. Our next workshop will be held on January 18th at 7 p.m. and that will be um, remote as well. And that is with Pat Davis and she will be focusing on depression in children. I also wanted to share that our next full day of professional development will be this Friday. The day is broken up into specific sessions based on grade levels as well as department levels. And some of the focuses will be on differentiated instruction, assessment and our assessment tools, as well as DEI work. And some of our departments will also be offsite, um, such as our art department, and they will be at the South Shore Art Center. Um, we have also quite a few committee meetings in the upcoming weeks. So we have our um, science curriculum committee will be meeting next week, along with our professional development committee, in addition to our school wellness advisory committee, which will be meeting on January 24th. So the work with our committees will be focusing on um, what is being done this year, but also we are turning towards next year and looking to the work that needs to be continued, as well as any um, additional work that we may be planning for, for the 2022-23 school year. And I would also just like to um, thank all of the staff members um, for all of their work over the past um, few days and within the last week, it has been um, an interesting return. We wanna thank everybody who's gone above and beyond. And certainly we also have specific recognitions as well. Shannon Jones, Cheryl Lewis, Michael Cowett, Maria Bronco, Heather Barnett, Chris White, Beth Nichols, Margie Malone, Andrea O'Neill, Sarah Dooley, Katie Jacobson, Pat Queenie, Stacey O'Brien, Peter George, Michael Bagshaw, Melanie Levine, Stacey O'Brien, Teresa Raftery, Karen, Kara King, and Karen Doyle. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilcox. Um, if there are no questions, next we'll have a report from the Director of Business and Finance, Ms. Blake. Hi, everyone. Um, my only update for tonight is to review the two invoice warrants that were processed since our last meeting in December. Um, we had warrant number 26, which was processed on December 24th um, in the amount of 
$474.70. Um, we also processed warrant number 28, and that was processed on January 7th. Um, and the total amount of that invoice warrant was $158,624.73. Great, thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, now report from Director of Special Education, Ms. Tucker. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I just have a couple um, opportunities for parents and students that I just wanted to report out on. Um, as part of my ongoing um, events this year, we have a, a special education office hours, um, which is an opportunity to kind of celebrate overarching strengths and discuss areas of growth. Um, I'll be sending that uh, email Zoom link out to families. Um, also, the CPAC on January 24th. Um, at 5 p.m. is having um, the Pilgrim Area Collaborative Paces program um, present on called the emotional brain. And that presentation is um, emotions have an impact on learning. They influence our ability to process information and to accurately understand what we encounter. But how much do parents really know about emotions? And, you know, there's never been a more important time to look closely at how our emotions are impacting our children. And, um, Noticing that there's a presentation of higher rates of anxiety, depression, um, and wanting to be able to um, support students to really be present in their learning environments and function within their local communities. So this workshop will explore the emotional system and get a better understanding of how it impacts behavior and learn some strategies to incorporate that emotional resistance into, I mean, emotional resilience, not resistance, sorry, into our, um, parenting strategies. So as a parent, I'm also looking forward to that one. And then um, the Soulful Girls Club, which was that um, opportunity for a, a social hangout um, that was presented um, in collaboration with, um, developed by a parent, but in collaboration with the Soul Project is having the next event on January 21st. And so um, information will be sent out for that as well. Um, and that's kind of our special education updates, but some good things to come for people to attend. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Tucker. Um, so next, um, I don't believe we have any student representatives with us tonight. So we'll move on to the chair report. I thought, Mike, do we I have? thought Mike O'Malley was in the... Was he in the... I don't... Mike? I think it's Michael. I think it might okay. be his O'Malley because Michael because Michael just um, emailed me. But if it is you, Michael, and you want to raise your hand, I can promote you to the panelists. But I, I'm pretty sure Michael's not coming this evening. Okay. I just happened to see. Um, so I thought maybe it was him. He had a conflict. Ah. Uh, so for the chair report, um, I just, most of what I have is under an agenda item. So um, I just wanna say thank you to everybody in the district from administrators, teachers, fact, you know, staff, everybody who's worked so hard over the last few weeks um, to keep the kids in school. Um, I know it's been a really hard few weeks and I'm just so impressed with the efforts and the um, extra work that's gone into it. So thank you. Um, and then, also just uh, really impressed recently with the support that we're providing our families through these various presentations, including the CPAC one that um, Ms. Tucker just mentioned and the um, anxiety presentation yesterday that I was able to participate in. Um, I just think the district's going above and beyond in terms of supporting our families. And I, I just wanna, again, a huge thank you for all the work that's going into those, the, those uh, initiatives. Um, so with that, I think we move on to uh, correspondence and new business. If anybody would like the floor, just let me know. Ms. Bresnahan. I was just going to give a shout out. The um, Globe, Sunday Globe did the um, fall athlete shout outs, the superstar athletes. And for football, it was Delby Lemieux, who we know is going to Dartmouth, and Brady Madigan. And then for volleyball, it was Mackenzie Pruku. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. So kudos to them. Great. Thank you. I do have um, an item that I'd like to share under new business, okay. if that's OK. Yes. Uh, 
we've been approached by the Alden Kindred of America, and they are proposing a memorandum of understanding um, that is an easement um, in agreement with the town of Duxbury. So the easement that they are proposing would be over school owned property um, for a walking path area to achieve access to the Alden First House Foundation. And so that area is located on the, um, the Alden ball fields. If you're in the back of Alden school and you look in the left, fi left field area, um, there is some, a roped off section that's been there, but this um, easement that they're looking for is, a, is larger than that roped off area. And so the area has been recently surveyed um, that Alden Kindred had asked for the area to be surveyed. And so that will be staked off with um, markers in the next week. So if anyone wanted to drive by to be able to take a look or even walk the area to see where those stakes would be, that would be really helpful. Um, the easement would grant the Alden Kindred Association access to the principal home site of the Mayflower passengers, John and Priscilla Alden. Um, which is a part of a national historic landmark. And they, they are looking to ensure that the site is prever, preserved for future archeological study because underground there are the remains of the original homestead and there's most certainly artifacts underground on that site. So the Alden Kindred um, shared that the easement will place into public record the practices that the Kindred Association and the town of Duxbury have used to allow public access to the site since 1960. When the, when the foundation was first discovered during an archaeological dig. The Kindred understands that the current employment of the site as athletic fields for the Duxbury Schools and Recreation Department is the primary use of a section of that area, um, and visitor access to the first site is accomplished on a not-to-interfere basis. Um, they're looking to have this propo proposal um, go before the select board in February, and there's a placeholder for this item to be voted upon at our annual town meeting in March and to be placed on the warrant. And so I wanted to um, alert the school committee and just have you take a look at the documents that I placed this evening in tonight's school committee folder so that you could take a look at the proposed um, MOU as well as the site, a picture of the site, which is a little bit hard to see. And it's probably better if you do have an opportunity. I'm glad to walk the site area. Um, Christina Knowles, our facilities director could also meet um, if you wanted to take a walk over the site before um, any decisions are made on this. But Desiree Mobed, um, who is the director of the Alden Kindred of America and the Alden House Historic Site, has offered to attend our February 9th school committee meeting to discuss this proposal and answer any questions you may have. And so again, I, it, it wasn't in your folder until an hour ago. So I wanted you to have that mater those materials available to review. But I also wanted to bring that to your attention so that you are aware that that's kind of coming up in the coming weeks. Do, do we know when they're going before the select board? Um, I've heard the February 7th meeting um, mentioned. I don't know if that's confirmed if they actually have the agenda. And so we wouldn't be meeting um, until February 9th. So the select board meeting would be in ahead of our um, next school committee meeting where you would have a chance okay. to hear from Desiree. So I had a chance to look at the memorandum of understanding for the meeting. And um, there's, there's no reference to the school committee or to the superintendent or to the Alden school principal or, or anything um, in terms of kind of agreeing access to the site. So I'm curious to know, did they engage with you at all in, in drafting the MOU or is this something that was just handed to you? The MOU was prepared without uh, my input at this time, but I believe it is still in draft form. So I think that we would have an opportunity um, when Desiree visits the school committee meeting um, and, and answers any questions to make any adjustments, what I would think. So okay. why don't I follow up with the select board just to make sure that we're not, that we're aligned in terms of that. I don't want the select board to vote and approve something on the seventh and we haven't had a chance to have a discussion about it until the ninth. So I'll, if everyone's okay with that, I can take that as an action item. Yeah, because at some point they print these things and there's a printer's deadline. So if we're going to be involved in amendments to the draft, right. we need to kind of know that sooner or later. I'm just concerned that, I mean, um, Danielle, you were referencing that Ms. Mobez seems to think that there'll be consultation about access to the site with the schools. 
but that doesn't appear to be in the MOU. And so I think if that's what she's expecting to happen, that should be in writing somewhere. I agree. Yeah. Okay. I just had two little things. Okay. Um, yep. I just wanted to tell the Duxbury High School um, students and staff that worked on the Ink Inkblot magazine that I thought it was an exceptional job. They did an exceptional job both the photography, the drawings, and the poems. Um, I was really impressed. I didn't get to read everything, um, but I did look through it twice actually and it was really impressive so great job on that and then second as we are approaching on um, elections i didn't know if maybe at some point in our next meeting we could just go over the school committee uh candidate orientation policy just to make sure we're all on the same page with that and um i just think it'd be worth a read through and a conversation so if we could um i don't know if it has to go to the policy committee first or whatnot, but. Oh, I shouldn't think so. Do you think so? No, I don't think yeah. so. I think we can just discuss it. Okay. So yeah, we'll just put it on as an agenda item. Okay, great. Thank you, that's all. Okay. Okay, so now we're moving on um, to our discussion items. And the first one is the elementary reading update by Ms. Benoit and Ms. Milner. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi. Good night. It's nice to see everyone. Good evening. We appreciate the time tonight to provide you with an update on reading instruction and professional development at the elementary level. It's always nice to join this group and showcase the hard work that our teachers do every day. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about professional development this year because our professional development has focused almost solely on reading instruction and improving reading instruction. So, um, so far this year, we've been very productive with regards to professional development in literacy, uh, more specifically in reading, which has been a large part of our focus. We've continued um, our working relationship with the Teaching and Learning Alliance to guide our work um, with regards to elevating our reading instruction to best meet the needs of all learners and apply the principles highlighted um, in the most current research on how st students learn to read. Uh, so our first full day uh, PD in October devoted to this um, was a launch for this work this year. So all teachers received a copy of this book called Shifting the Balance. Uh, this is a text by Jan Birkins and Carrie Yates. Um, and basically it contains six ways to bring the science of reading into the literacy classroom successfully. Um, so all teachers received a copy of the book um, and are working this year to read, unpack and apply the recommended shifts in their classrooms. And TLA is, is um, supporting that work. So um, in October, when we met in the morning, the TLA consultants um, launched the book study and went over and previewed all six of these important shifts. Then teachers were put in small groups by grade level to uh, determine which shifts were the most relevant for their grade level, uh, because certain ones apply to various grade levels depending on the developmental levels of the kids. And they had awesome discussions during that time. Um, and the work will continue throughout the year in coaching cycles with TLA um, on site, hopefully, um, as we get closer uh, to, to the end of the year, we hope to have some in person days with them. But they're coaching uh, teachers in the classroom um, in making some of these shifts. So that's what we've done so far. Sarah's going to talk to you a little bit about um, the other professional development we've yeah, been so involved. we we had our second professional development day with TLA in December 
And um, Becca, who's been running our PD, has been, is on maternity leave. So I know Alden has taken a little bit of a pause, um, but we're working with Jen Yeager and she took the time in uh, December to make sure that we were um, aligning everything that we heard about the science of reading and shifting the balance back in October with Becca and start to look at that as we consider small group instruction, which is really in line with our district focus right now on having differentiated instruction, um, using data and really targeting what students need during that small group time or one-on-one -on -one time. So we wanted to kind of bridge uh, what we're doing, what we started with TLA and the science of reading and bring that into our small group time as well. So the teachers that day, they got to um, first look at independent work time and how to best, how students could best use their time because that really allows the teachers time to have small groups and that's been a struggle. Um, time is always a struggle um, and how to get things done. So Jen kind of helped them organize their scheduling for that. Um, they also really got to like expand and deepen their understanding of various types of small groups and knowing that it's not just pulling students for maybe comprehension, but word work and phonics, phonemic awareness at our uh, grade levels especially is also important to incorporate into small group time. Um, and just also looking at which data would be most effective for those small groups and the different types. Um, we've also already had one coaching day, which we really turned into a conferencing day because our teachers really felt they wanted time just to, um, to meet and talk about some of the challenges they're facing um, with intervention and small group time, given some of the current climate and circumstances. So um, they found it really valuable to meet with Jen um, in small groups throughout the day versus having models of lessons in the classroom, but that is how we'll spend the remainder of our time. Um, you know, along with that partnership with TLA, we also received a grant that uh, Dr. Wilcox set up for us, um, which also uh, happens to be run by TLA. So um, it's for a South Shore coaching collaborative team. And the focus is also on just building strong early literacy skills. DESI also has a great literacy leadership team, um, which is a really nice opportunity for us to meet with other districts and peers who have similar goals. And we get to share resources that really align with the same things we're doing here in literacy in Duxbury. And another along the same lines of um, professional opportunities for uh, Sarah and myself, we also um, were invited to the CASE conference, which is a Title I conference. Again, this was our second year being invited. So fortunately this year, uh, one whole strand of sessions for them was on the science of reading. So we were able to attend a number of sessions on the most recent research. Um, it was very timely and it was an, a, a great opportunity because we were able to network with leaders from many districts. Um, who are struggling with the same things that we are in terms of making sure that what we're doing um, is well aligned to both the Massachusetts standards and, of course, the, the most recent research. So, um, you know, for example, I don't, you know, those of you who are into the science of reading and learning about it, Timothy Shanahan is, is a speaker um, and a writer about this topic, and he was one of the keynote speakers, so uh, as well as he, he ran a couple of other sessions too. So we were able to go and listen to him. Um, it was, you know, the networking opportunity was also really good for us because it helped us see that we are on target with the focus areas that we've chosen to work on for this year and, and you know, the next couple of years, um, district leaders everywhere are working on the same reading improvements. So that was just, it's just comforting to know that we're sort of all on the same page. So that was a great opportunity. And so for example, some of the, the changes that we're actually in the process of implementing um, at Alden School, one of the things, um, phonemic awareness, which primarily is a skill for the, the primary grades. However, especially in light of the pandemic in recent years, this is, you know, phonemic awareness and phonics have um, been skills that kids come to us really still needing work in this area. So as you know, Foundations is a phonics program that uh, Chandler implemented several years ago. And it is a K to three program. So two years ago, we looked at um, incorporating the grade three piece of that. And we've really enjoyed having foundations 
um, in our third grade. And then this year, we also um, gave teachers in grades three, four, and five phonemic awareness resources. So Hegarty is um, a company that provides a really strong phonemic awareness routine. Uh, and again, it's, it's originally designed for younger grade levels, but it's still very appropriate at grade three right now. Um, so some of our classrooms have already started implementing it. We do have on Friday, we have a professional development day. And so we are working on Hegarty and um, Bridge the Gap, which is their intervention, really uh, their intervention resource tied to the same routines that's for fourth and fifth grade. So like something that you would offer in your small group lessons to students who need it. Um, so those are two, two things that we've added this year and last that last year and this year, to sort of beef up that part of reading instruction. Um, to go along um, with that, we are looking at our comprehension strategies because uh, while comprehension is one of the things that our, our reading units are very, very strong in and we like them very much, we have to go through them and make sure that some of the comprehension strategies that are not being recommended are not still in our lessons. So for example, one topic is um, how do kids approach a, a word that they don't know? So we wanna make sure that students are approaching it um, from the visual first and unpacking the phonics of the word, sound it out um, is really where we want them to start and then use meaning and structure to double check their work and make sure that um, what they think they've sounded out is right versus going after looking at the pictures first. So those are subtle changes, but really important changes. So those are some of the things that we're, we're looking at to make sure that kids um, can do the, you know, their brains can do the orthographic mapping that needs to be done. So it's a lot of learning, um, especially at the intermediate level. And, but it is very interesting work and the teachers have been enjoying it so far. Um, the final thing that I would say is a shift, um, a more recent shift is looking at the place, and Sarah will talk a little more about this, but looking at the place of decodable texts in reading instruction. Um, and in terms of students' book choice during independent reading time, we've always done a great job of giving them a balanced diet of books in their reading bag, some selected by the teacher to support the skill they're working on and some selected by the student um, based on um, their ability to read something of interest independently. But we also need to look at are there, you know, do we have some students who need to have some decodable readers in their book bag to practice those skills if that's what they're working on in small group with their teachers during conferring and small group work. Um, and then finally, you know um, that we have a district-wide focus this year in professional development on um, differentiation, differentiation and using data to inform instruction and intervention. So that combined with the work we're doing with the science of reading is really powerful and impactful overall for kids. Um, yeah, so we also, uh, using the shifts, and I like how you said they were subtle changes, because I know going into this year, especially handing them a book with like six shifts to make in literacy instruction was um, a little, made us a little nervous on how it would be accepted. But what was really nice after that first PD was the teachers looking through it and realizing how much of it we really do already do, um, especially at Chandler, because we are pre k to two. So this is where those foundational skills are being built up. Um, we did recognize uh, two years ago when we did our review that phonemic awareness was a need. Um, we kind of knew it as we implemented foundations that that was a missing piece. So kindergarten had already started to implement a unit that they worked on with TLA two or more summers ago. Um, for the, that they used in the fall as an introduction, but then we realized we really needed more and that's where Hegarty came in. So they've actually been implementing the Hegarty uh, program. It's a tier one instruction. It's just about a 10 minute daily um, phonemic awareness drill. And the kids just call it word games. There is no materials involved at all. And um, they implemented that just over a year ago. So they've been using it for quite a while. First grade started this fall. And then like Reed Marie said, second grade uses Bridge the Gap, which is from Hegarty. It's, it's the same, except it's identifying students that have a need for review of skills that they would have previously learned and using it just during intervention. Um, we've had a lot of 
uh, positive feedback from the teachers. Uh, the kindergarten special educator especially was saying she really noticed going into the various classrooms um, how well the students were be able to start decoding sooner because the phonemic awareness really is done alongside of phonics instruction. It helps them to decode and eventually encode better as well. Um, you know, we just did um, a lot of our assessing and we'll say 92% of our kindergarten students just scored um, average or above on our uh, phonemic awareness uh, probe, the phonemic segmentation, which is great because like in foundations, they really wouldn't have even been introduced to that skill just yet. And they're already, um, you know, kind of ahead of the curve for that. And at the end of last year, when they were using foundations uh, alongside of Hegarty for the second term, they, we had 100% of our kindergarten students met the benchmark for nonsense word fluency, which, you know, I had not seen before. So those are really great gains we're seeing from the data, but also from the teachers and the, uh, the educators that work in the classrooms and what they're seeing. Um, and yes, we also have shift six. So phonemic awareness is shift two and shift six is looking at beginning text and reconsidering what those should look like. And we have had um, a lot of leveled readers. We have a fabulous um, book room, but we have also realized that there's a need for decodable text as well, which are really support our emerging readers more and um, specifically have them practice the skills that they are being taught in phonics and phonemic awareness. So we received a very generous grant from the DEF to help us uh, support building up our decodable library. And we're really grateful to them for that support. That's me, yes. Um, so very before, right. I, go, okay. before I, go, um, I will also say um, a couple of things. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, you know, we have all these materials and resources, but it's really, it comes down to like the expertise of the teachers and they're really making those critical decisions in the moment of how to implement the materials and how to roll out the instruction. And, um, you know, I can't go a school committee meeting without <laughs> just praising our educators here at Chandler. Um, also, I think it's important that Rita Marie and I have talked a lot in the past year or so, just having a really strong data protocol in place and making sure that everyone is on board with what that looks like. It's consistent. Um, we're trying to be consistent between the two schools for the families. So, um, and providing families information as well as out to the staff so that we're all kind of on the same page with what data is being used when and making sure it's the most, um, important data to be looking at. So then finally, I mean, everything we do, we always look for, you know, the measure of its impact on students, right? But this year, you know, right now, we are just wrapping up winter screening. So we really don't have the ability to fully analyze um, data from the fall to the winter at this time. We have our data meetings coming up next week. Um, but we, in a very broad way, have been able to look at some of the, um, yeah, sort of the broad overview of how it's trending so far. And it's very promising. We are seeing um, our oral reading fluency scores and our reading comprehension scores. We definitely are seeing marked improvement from the fall. And we also see improvement from this time last year, which to me is even more significant because I know we worry about how our kids um, are faring with regards to the pandemic um, and any kind of learning loss. And we are definitely seeing that our winter scores this year are stronger uh, already, even though we don't have all the data in than they were last winter, which is great um, and fully expected. We also um, very unofficially, again, because you know MCAS scores really couldn't be compared in the same way we usually do to former years, but we were able to look at the standards mastery portion of the MCAS results to see that our strength in fifth and sixth grade um, in terms of any kind of change we're seeing is in reading comprehension standards. So we feel that that's sort of promising information too, very unofficially, but um, it makes us feel good. So we look forward to further um, being able to analyze our data in a more concrete way um, when things start to shape back up to a normal year. 
And that's all we have for tonight. If you have any questions for us. Um, I have a few. That's okay. Um, my first one is, um, have you been able to implement the small groups and how are they going if so? Because I can't imagine with, so. So in a general way, you mean because of the pandemic and so forth? Well, one of the things, <laughs> Yeah, dis social distancing. But one of the things that actually we've been doing for years in terms of small group is, is conferring with students, which is more of a one-to-one -one, um, conference. And teachers can maintain that with students because they can control that distance better when they're dealing with one student, right? So I was actually thinking more of with like people being out and things along those like staffing more so than social distancing. Oh yeah, no, I mean, it's so much ingrained in the, the process of reader's workshop and what we do. It's so much a part of that reading block that you can do. You have the time built in for small group and, and so forth. We haven't really this year had many instances of kids being out so long that that would be impacted. So okay. yeah, we've, we've definitely been able to do that certainly not the way we're used to and um but it's you know teachers are finding ways to work either one-on-one -on -one with kids or um through the plexiglass when they need to for um, small group instruction and our okay. staffing levels although we've faced a surge have um yeah. learning has gone on and i think that's the most important thing that despite the challenges that we've had last last year into this year um you would see pretty typical learning going on and there haven't been instances where we're um, housing kids in a place where they're not being instructed so i don't think that um despite the challenges last week i think that everyone if if you had a, a lens into the school would be pleased to see that learning has continued despite the um many hurdles that we're facing on a daily basis but um I know that the principals and the administrative assistants have worked really hard to keep our building staffed and we make sure that instruction is happening, even if there's a substitute um, teacher or instructional assistant or a tutor. And then the data points that you are speaking of, I would really like to see them um, in a graph format. I think that would be really fantastic to be able to chart the pro just to see their progress and also to see how these six steps are, you know, helping you and the different strategies that you are implementing. And I feel like that then helps us decide on budget issues or yes, we need this, or, you know, it would help me feel better about approving certain things for the budget if I had hardcore data to refer to. Um, yeah. So I know you're still looking at that and you're just getting that winter data in, but I would love if uh, it doesn't have to be long, but uh, if you guys could come back or if Danielle could, or Dr. Klingerman can show it, but just to see some where the kids are, where they were even last year to the fall to winter and just kind of chart that progress. Right. No, we, we usually do have a, a nice like one page with graphs and stuff on it for, for you, certainly by the time the year is beginning to wrap up and, you know, we can look at that. That we can also look at the mid-year when the winter benchmarks are in. So that is something we could share sooner than the end of the year too. Mm -hmm. That would be great. I think, I think that's all right now. And no, um, you had mentioned last year that you had sort of wanted a literacy, literacy coach. And when you were going through, um, is it TLA? Have they provided some of that assistance for you? Am I messing up the name of the group? No, that's, that's okay. their name. Um, so, well, in a variety of ways, yes. Yeah. So when they're here um, and they're with us, they're certainly providing a, an element of coaching, small groups, whole, whole groups, grade levels. It's been a variety of ways. Plus, as Sarah mentioned, you know, they're working individually with Sarah and I as part of a coaching group. So we're also getting um, our, you know, our own coaching strategies. They're helping us build those, um, you know, definitely different than having a uh, you know, a full-time literacy coach that's sort of in-house and available all the time for sure. But yes, they, they do a, a great deal to um, improve coaching in our, in our schools. Great. Thank you. Uh, hey, this is Matt. I just had one uh, question and it might've been covered when you were um, talking about small group, but Sarah, earlier in your part of the presentation, you mentioned that I think it was like during some professional development time, the teachers had gotten together and they were talking about some of the challenges that they were facing in small group. Yeah. And I was just wondering what 
bubble to the surface in that conversation that you guys saw that yeah. the teachers yeah. right now are sort of commenting on as with regard to small group instruction. Right. So I think for that particular time, it was really because we've been looking at the shifts and we've been talking so much about the um, best practices for instruction for a while now. So now it's like we were thinking about how can we turn that into our small group instruction? And we've been doing a lot of, as Rita Marie said, you do conferring from the workshop model. We've doing a lot of comprehension based small groups. But now they're at our level, at least we're also seeing that we need to have those word work small groups that might need to have uh, phonemic awareness in there. There's different needs. Um, it's not, and that was where kind of some of the, not the confusion, but just discussion. There was so much that the teachers were saying, well, how do I know what to do when? So that was where Jen was working with us on what the characteristics are of each of types of small groups that can be uh, implemented and what would be some of the data to use to see if students would need, do they need more word work? Do they need comprehension? Do they need strategies? Do they need strategy groups? Do they need um, phonemic awareness practice? So I think that was really just what she was working on with them is kind of outlining what the types of groups are and what to use when. I see. Okay, thanks. And I'm just really curious, does the mask wearing create any sort of a, no pun intended, a barrier to teaching phonics? <laughs> like, definitely. I'm just wondering how you deal with that. It's definitely a hindrance here. I mean, I just, we just did our screenings with Ames Web, where I sat with the reading specialists and we just work one-on-one -on -one with um, every student in all three grades and sit with them and listen to them read and say sounds. But some of it's they're repeating from words that we say, and you, you can just see the challenges. You know, I say cat and they sound out bat, you know, but and it's it's not because they don't know the, the sound. It's because of they just really need to see the mouth and yeah. hear the sounds clearly. And I know from the our speech and language uh, therapists have been saying that as well. It's it's really a challenge. Does Hegarty help with that? Do they can they look at a screen and see? Uh, you know, so Hegarty is it's definitely uh, Hegarty is the teacher saying the words and the sounds. So for example, they might say like, "Give me the sound," um, b b and. Yeah at and change b to k and it's like they're doing all this and you hear it but you can tell it it's it's harder but um you know as danielle said the teaching and learning still goes on so they're really making the most of it um and they're getting it they're getting it done so yeah um but it, it's it's a little it's tough slog for everybody but it sounds mm -hmm. like you're making it work so that's great thank yeah. you Quick question related to that. Didn't we talk about getting clear masks for some of the staff for that exact reason at Chandler? We did, and Kristen found um, some clear masks that didn't fog. They're just not as comfortable as the regular masks, the way they are, the way they feel. So wearing those for a sustained amount of time. I do think we have some staff members that are wearing clear masks. The face shields are unfortunately not enough. And um, I think many of our staff members are now wearing the KN95 masks. And so um, we have we will continue to make the offer if there's any staff members with the, um, that would prefer to use a clear mask, we're glad to purchase them and we can purchase them from that, um, the mask that Kristen found that really doesn't fog. Um, and so that continues to be an option for everyone. It's just a little more muffled. I don't know if it's because of the type of material used. The ones that, that they have now, I know the teachers are really happy with. Okay. Okay. Right. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'm going to move so much. I'm going to move you back to attend role as attendee. <laughs> Thank Great. You. Thank Thanks, you guys. Bye. Have a good Thank night. You. you too. Okay. So next on our uh, discussion items, credit for life fair. This is Rafferty. Yep. I will be promoting Mrs. Rafferty to panelist and also Ms. Radzik. Here they are. Hi, everyone. Hi, Good there. Evening. Hello. 
Hi. All right, I'm going to share my screen so your presentation will appear. Is that okay? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we are planning, we had a little pivot um, recently, our original date for our Credit for Life Fair at the high school, which is a financial literacy fair, um, was going to be um, the beginning of February, on February 3rd. But given the um, uptick in um, COVID numbers, we've extended it and kind of decided to move it to um, April 13th. Um, so this will be um, scheduled for April 13th. All senior, um, all senior Duxbury High School seniors will be able to participate in the fair and it will run, um, I think that was a video of one of our past years. So I think we're on about the year seven right now of running the financial literacy fair, um, which is a day where all seniors participate and they get to um, go through the a day in a life where they have, are they choose an occupation and they have to go see, we have volunteers over at the steel building that run, um, they have to go choose, you know, they go and they, um, actually we can go to the next slide. I think this one was just a video. So we can go to the next one. Thank you. So this is the, um, a little information about the student experience. So before the fair, uh, the seniors have been given a pre orientation presentation similar to this one. And they've given a list of potential careers which they have to choose from. They have selecting a career that they potentially might be interested in. And they also um, are a choice of, um, four workshops out of a choice of um, six possible. And Mrs. Raftery is going to be talking a little bit about the workshops in a few minutes. I'm gonna be focusing more on the fair part of the uh, part of the day. So we're gonna kick off um, the, and be in the presentation hall at DHS. And the students will each get a padfolio with an individual um, customized spreadsheet where they have so much money to spend on a monthly budget and they need to budget their money and make choices about rent, make choices about uh, transportation, about clothing, about um, insurance, you know, all the real life situations. So it's it's a really great day. Um, the seniors in the past, we did have to run it remotely last year, um, but in the past they've really enjoyed the fair and they said it's such a good takeaway, just a, um, a day about focusing on budgeting and having real life discussions and the volunteers in Duxbury have been phenomenal um, and they really have great, great conversations over at the fair. Um, so the students will attend the fair. So we split the, the um, senior class into two uh, sections. So half of them will attend the fair first at the steel building and half of them will attend the workshops first and then we'll uh, it'll be two workshops that they will attend and then we switch and the ones at the fair go to the workshops and vice versa and then after the fair the students get to do a little bit of a, a survey and usually do a little bit of a, of a kind of a debrief as to what, how their experience was and what their takeaways were um, so again, the, all the seniors will be participating, and that's a little bit about the two sections. Um, we do, we'll have a kickoff, um, we'll have a kickoff meeting. Everyone will be in the um, presentation hall first, and then we will split into the two sections. And then this is a little bit about the pad folio. They will get information based on their selection about a salary, uh, and it'll be a monthly budget to spend or the monthly budget, and they'll also have um, student loan amounts that they have to pay. Um, and they'll have a credit score too, which will be randomly selected. And so students will have to take a look. Some of the students realize based on the credit scores that they have to go to the um, to their uh, credit and savings and they have to think about, okay, how do I, I have to pay off some of my credit, my um, my debt first before I can start, um, start actually visiting the other booths. Um, and again, the student loan debt was based on their occupation that they are cho that they chose, but the credit score is randomly selected. This is a little bit. It's, I know it's hard to see, but it's just a form how they do have to um, visit variety of booths um, and you know about clothing, food. Um, there is a wheel of fortune where you could win um, money in a lottery ticket or you get a flat tire. So that's life, real life. Um, and uh, uh, Chris Coakley has been phenomenal. She's been partnering, partnering with us since we started. Um, so uh, Mrs. Raftery, myself, um, um, Mrs. Coakley, and then Ms. Donovan at the high school as well. We have been in 
Um, Mrs. Coakley has been phenomenal, like phenomenal about getting volunteers in the community and the Duxbury community has been such a great um, partner in, in this. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it, do it without them. So it's really a great, a great day and a great experience. Um, and I'm going to um, turn it over to Mr. Raptory talking about the student workshops. Please disregard the chimes in the background. They'll go off periodically because I'm in a house of clocks. <laughs> Um, but the student workshops are, the kids have, I've been involved as just kind of an ear in the room for many years. And the kids are so into um, asking questions and learning about all of the different things. But there's a different workshop that they can choose from. They'll choose two. And there's a career pathway in finance. If they're interested in finance or business, they may choose this one to go and learn more. Um, a lot of our kids go to investment. Um, we have quite a few kids that are already investing. So they think they can pick up tips and um, think how to get rich quick. Um, we have networking, just the power of knowing people and knowing um, who to contact. Credit scores, um, a lot of our kids learn a lot about credit scores um during this one and realize that they are very important to their future um how to do a job interview how to what the importance of it what to wear what job um bosses are looking for and different tips on how to sell yourself um, and dr Kligaman, you've run that one in the past and i think you'll be running that one again if i'm not mistaken correct that's, that's the one that I do, it's it's like resume writing, job search, and um, interviewing. So it's a lot of fun, <laughs> and it's also never too early to think about retirement. And the kids get a chance to talk about um, or listen to how to retiring early and how to make sure that as soon as you get your first job, you're thinking about retirement. And then there's the entrepreneurs who we ha already have. Um, Quite a, few, uh, quite a number of students who already have kind of the small businesses and they self-run businesses. So they get a chance to learn more about that. But it's, it's always one of the best days of the senior year. And then what do we have? It, it just, yeah, just why credit's important. So I think that might be the last slide. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always incredible to see the kids all dressed up with their pad folios and um, making their budgets and figuring out what they can afford with these jobs when they are walking around. And then the um, students are just really attentive in the sessions and ask um, incredible questions. I'm always so proud to see our students so engaged with some of the retirement questions, which I don't think you see a lot of students learning about retirement before they've even graduated from high school. Um, and I just have to credit the all of you that organize it. The, the speakers that you have come in are incredible and the sessions are so worthwhile that Everyone that attends always says, I wish I had this when I was a senior. That's just such valuable, important information that's shared that day. Yeah, and the kids do realize it. Um, I always like to talk to my class afterwards and they're always, um, they always really like the day and they learn a lot. Um, I, I always like the fair too, because it, the fair is in some ways it's a little unstructured. They walk in and sometimes the students look at me and say, well, what do I do? I said, you have to figure it out. You know, you right. go walk around, use your resources, network, talk to the community members. So it's kind of a nice experience where it's not, no one's in the, at the fair experience, they're not being told you have to go to this one booth first and then that, that next, the next booth. It's they kind of figuring out how is, how does life work? So it's a great day. The kids really um, learn a lot. Does anyone have questions for us about the Credit for Life Fair? Mm -hmm. I have one question. I, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of this. I love that you do this. Um, kids who are going in the military or into a trade, what do they choose for their pathways? So it's they, can choose those pa they can choose those pathways. Oh, and then, okay. um, yep, they, they obviously we have that pathway as an option. I just wanted to say both my kids thought this was fantastic and they learned a lot and they really appreciated not having to hear it for their mother. Okay. So um, 
it was really, really good. Thank you. They have, um, they get roommates, right? As part of like the sort of oh, the profile. They, 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 have don't, they don't get them, they can choose them. They some choose of them, them, yeah. When they realize that it, life is expensive, um, and then yeah. it, they get some interesting conversations, but they can't. Yeah, they... I, I mean, it was crazy. I was talking to a senior last year who was telling me about her, you know, the roommate and she was getting like borderline emotional and angry with her roommate for not being responsible. And she's like, how are you going to afford this stuff? Look at your feet. <laughs> so uh, I think it just, I mean, I'll echo what Danielle said that she hears like, I wish I had it when I was in, in high school. It just sounds like a really valuable um, life skill to learn early on. So great job doing it. It sounds awesome. Thanks. And any community members that are interested in participating, please reach out to either one of us um, and we'd love to have you. Definitely. And Matt, to go with what you were saying, um, my favorite story is I had one student a couple of years ago who ended up with eight roommates in a two bedroom apartment because that's how she wanted to afford clothing budget and <laughs> she had to buy clothes. So the trade-off was she lived in a postage stamp area on the floor of a two bedroom apartment. Fun. So yeah. All the choices. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't really do that, but that's okay. Well, thank you both for coming in. We look forward to it in April. Yeah. It extended a little further out into the year, but it will be a great day. Hopefully it'll be nice out too. That will help. All right. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. I'll put you back into attendee mode. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Right, that was great. So uh, next we have our, the interim superintendent mid-year goals report with Dr. Klingelman. Yep. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And I know we have um, quite a long agenda tonight, and I know the budget hearing um, is very important. So I won't take up too much time reviewing this, but I wanted a chance for you, all of you to um, just take a look at the mid-year goals. I did put that in the folder last week, and I'm not going to read all of the updates, but um, my professional practice goal was to participate in the new superintendent's induction program called NSIP. It's provided by MASS, and that is it's very time intensive work, but I'm so grateful that I've been paired with a wonderful mentor this year. Ruth Gilbert Whitner has been spending a lot of time with me, both um, visiting in district, doing classroom walkthroughs, talking about teaching and learning, as well as any struggles that um, any superintendent is going through this year and the challenging continuation of COVID. Um, so that's been really valuable. I've attended all of the trainings. Um, we are working on the entry plan work that the entry plan was um, just that we're meeting with focus groups throughout the district of students, teachers, um, parents, our PTA um, members, school councils, and we're just getting feedback about what our district does really well, what our district um, community members are proud of, and where are some areas of growth and opportunity which is really valuable information. I think today, um, Beth and I sat with the PTA presidents and the CPAC president, and we just got some really valuable information about um, that our parents are really worried about where their students are performing this year. Are they making progress not only for themselves, but are they getting closer to where the, ex the expected performance level would be for a student in their grade? So I just think it's really, every time we sit and have a meeting with a focus group, we walk away with valuable information, knowing what our community members are are thinking and worrying about. So this has been wonderful. Um, we also have a document review we'll, where we will be reviewing our curriculum reviews, our contracts, our financial statements, our budgets, and going back years back in the budgets just to look for trends. So the document review is the next stage that we'll be um, looking at and making some determinations and analysis. And hopefully this work that we're doing this year will assist with the development of the strategic plan later in the year if we identify some areas of growth for the district that we could have a starting point when we do that strategic plan work with, um, with some focus groups that will be completing that. Um, did anyone have any questions about the, the uh, professional practice goal or that NSIP program or entry plan? I'll just keep going. 
The second um, student learning goal was focused on leading the district educators and the implementation of the blueprint for learning that I wrote last spring, which really focused a lot of the curriculum work that you've heard about today um, in terms of the teaching and learning alliance with the coaching that's happening. And the coaching is not only happening with our educators, but it's happening for our administrators so that we're calibrating and making sure we're on the same page in our conversations with teachers about what is most important this year so we can prioritize um, really that differentiation of instruction, making sure we're personalizing learning, learning for students, making sure that we're using, we spend so much time assessing and we have all this wonderful data. Are we using the data most effectively? And so it's been really exciting for me to see the blueprint come to life this year. Um, we were really proud of the summer program that we had in place and the intervention opportunities that we are seeing available to students now through the academic support block. And we know that moving forward, especially as you'll hear later with the budget, that we wanna to continue to enhance intervention opportunities for all of our students. Um, I did put a link to the professional development plans for elementary and secondary. So if you have a moment to click on those links to see all the wonderful training and work that our teachers and administrators have um, available to them this year. That would be great. We have um, we've continued on with our promise to provide parent workshops and not only for our parents, for um, our teachers and any of our educators who want to participate. And they've been wonderful so far. And our district improvement goal was to um, implement, oversee and lead the implementation of the district strategic plan in year three. And so with some of those, a lot of these are ongoing. Our wellness um, review is ongoing work that will be um, completed in the spring. Um, we did have a plan for the digital literacy coaches, and we really outlined um, what we felt was a strong plan for how those digital literacy coaches could have an impact on students and teachers. Unfortunately, when you're looking at um, budget priorities, that did not make it into our recommendations for this year. But I'm really hopeful that um, in the in the near future, we will able to be able to have our student um, students participate in additional STEM offerings and computer science K through 12. And I think those digital literacy coaches will be a way for us to do that. Um, freshman Academy model we have um, as a spring goal. And I think um, Mrs. Blake did a wonderful job um, developing a full day kindergarten implementation plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I know that we are working on the cultural competency for certificate as we develop the high school program of studies where it's that time of year where, where we're looking at course offerings for next year for our high school students. And um, the last di district improvement goal was just the COVID, um, all the COVID related changes that we've had in practice and we've had to pivot and adjust throughout the year. I'm really proud of the, the work we've done because it has been a challenge through all of the ups and downs of COVID. And I have to say the staff have been absolutely amazing to just um, continue on with, with making this year as normal and as solid as it possibly can be for our students. And so, we continue to take feedback. Um, we're working closely with other districts with DESI. We talk to the nurse that is working with DESI to make recommendations for ways that we can better address our COVID response. And um, we've had great attendance at the district COVID clinics. I think that um, the COVID vaccine clinics, which have been a very convenient way for some of our families who were interested in the vaccine or booster to be able to get appointments close to home, because I know that's been a challenge for people to get appointments um, elsewhere. People are driving, I heard today somebody was driving an hour to be able to get an appointment. So we're pleased that we can offer that right in district. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Or if you would like to um, meet with me individually in the coming weeks to talk about any of the um, goal areas, I'm happy as always to do that as well. So, in the district improvement goal, there were, as you mentioned, both the digital literary, literacy coaches and the um, all day kindergarten, full day kindergarten, didn't make the hurdle, the budget hurdle. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you feel that as a district, you've learned anything about from that that will make those plans more likely to get into the budget next time round or in future years? I think that we 
now have a concrete plan of what it would look like to implement a free full day program. I think it was in the abstract before. And I think Mrs. Blake's work where she was able to roll that out as a multi-year phased in approach now gives the community an idea of what we would need to do and plan for if we were to move to have that be a priority. Um, I think the digital literacy coaches in a post pandemic, and we keep saying post pandemic, but I feel as though we're still in the middle of COVID. So maybe I'll say post pandemic next year, but um, we're still in a, a real response to getting our students back on track for learning. And I think while we would love to see the STEM enhancement and our students op, um, have opportunities and our teachers have opportunities to more, do more project-based learning with that technology integration, we were on track with that prior to the pandemic. And I think we'll get back on track with that. So I see that as a goal area in the next, maybe not next school year, if we're planning for FY24, but I see that as something that will be really valuable in this community because we, we are blessed with strong technology resources. And I think that if we're going to make the investment in the devices themselves and the network and the infrastructure, we need to make sure we have digital literacy coaches in place as a, um, a longer term goal in the next two to three years. But I think this year, our, our biggest challenge is really making sure that intervention um, is available for all students. And I, I think when you have to prioritize, you hate to take things off of a list. But I think in this case, we had to put that off for at least a year. Fair enough. And then my my other question was about Freshman Academy, because we I recall talking about this for for several years. It's been um, an idea in the high school for for a while now. And so I, I'm hoping that um, that it will be developed um, in sufficiently concrete terms that it can actually get into the budget planning. For, for fiscal 24, is that likely? I believe so. And I think I saw Mrs. Dembowski in the audience. So I know she's listening, but she'll be a key um, person that we'll be turning to. Um, much like the full day kindergarten um, phased in approach, I would like to work with the um, high school staff and specifically with Mrs. Dembowski to really be able to financially plan out what it would take for a full day um, for a freshman academy model to be put in place. And what that means is um, more of a team-based approach to learning in grade nine, like the middle school that would allow our ninth graders a more um, phased in transition to high school where everything changes in high school in terms of your classes and your grading and you're suddenly everything counts and it's a lot of pressure for our ninth grade students. So I believe with the plan, while we may not be able to implement it next school year, I think that we'll be able to present to you what the um, economic implications would be and financial implications would be to have that sort of model at the high school. And we should be able to determine if we have the room to house that type of program at the high school as well as part of the plan. And I think if it looks, I think that's something that we can bring to the table at the strategic planning process to see if that's um, feasible and if there's an interest in the community to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll stop. Anybody else have any questions? No? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moon. Okay. So now we're moving on to the next item, which is the superintendent search update. And I will move Dr. Shirtleff and Thank you. Dr. Frost. Dr. Sherliff, I don't know if I see um, George Frost. Is he still with us? He's, he's in there. Oh, yep, he's first. Oh, his hand is up. There he is. That's what moved him to the top. <laughs> okay, hold on just one second. There we go. Great. Okay. So um, I want to thank the, both the Collins Center and the search committee for all the work that they've done. Um, going to um, provide an update, and then we have uh, several folks who can answer 
questions as, as needed. Um, as everyone knows, the application deadline for the superintendent search was December 3rd, 2021. And at that point, 11 applications were forwarded to the superintendent search screening committee. And on December 13th, after a thorough review of those written application materials, the screening committee met and engaged in an extended discussion of each candidate and ultimately reached consensus to invite five candidates in for interview. All candidates accepted and were interviewed during the evenings of January 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 2022. On January 5th, the 13 members of the school commit, screening committee, sorry, reached consensus on three candidates that we were prepared to forward to you for consideration. Uh, unfortunately, one of these candidates withdrew just this morning prior to public announcement. So um, as chair, I'm happy on, part of, on behalf of our appointed screening committee pleased to present two finalists to continue in the search process with the school committee. Uh, Dr. Danielle Klingeman, who is currently the interim superintendent of Duxbury Public Schools, and Alan Strebs, who is currently the principal of Weymouth High School and the district DEI coordinator for the Weymouth Public Schools. Um, there will be a press release and additional information on the school website under the superintendent search process so that you can, um, members of the community can learn more about these two candidates. Um, really excited to have them. The qualifications are very impressive, both candidates. Um, in terms of going forward, um, the school community will have an opportunity to meet these finalists when they engage in a scheduled stakeholder forums. There'll be different forums for staff, administrators, students, town officials, and parents, community members on Wednesday, January 19th. The parent community forums will take place in the afternoon of January 19th, and they will be Zoom forums. The links for those forums will be posted on the district website in the superintendent search informa information section, and that should be updated tomorrow morning. Um, the schedule for the school committee will also include a district site visit Zoom forum for each finalist um, on the January 24th or January 25th. And the school committee interviews are expected to take place on Wednesday, January 26th with a deliberation and decision by this committee on the evening of January 27th. Um, the school committee would like to especially thank members of the screening committee for their extraordinary dedication and commitment to the search process. The screening committee met five different evenings to prepare, review, interview, debate, deliberate, deliberate, and decide on the finalists presented to the Duxbury School Committee. They were truly professional in this critical endeavor, and we are, Duxbury should be very proud of these community members. The screening committee included uh, school committee member Julia Adams, uh, Heather Barnett, Audrey Batu, Sue Bradford, Megan Camera, Lieutenant Lewis Chubb, Tom Drummy, Jennifer Fiorentino, Anthony Keedy, Sarah McGuire, Priscilla Nisi, Mark Prince, and Caitlin Sheehan. Um, again, I just want to thank anybody, everybody for all the efforts that have gone into this process. Um, been very impressed with the updates and the uh, engagement um, of our screening committees. Thank you. So with that, if anybody has any questions, um, that again, there's going to be a press release tomorrow morning and additional information posted on the public um, on our website, the school's website, with all the details about the forums and that type of thing. So people can look there for those details. But um, the screening committee has now handed off to the school committee. So now the school committee has a full agenda for the next couple of weeks. Shannon, I just want to echo your thanks to the screening committee. I know it's a lot of work and um, dedication. So really, this is extremely important to us. As you all know, this is probably our biggest commitment to being on school committee. So um, thank you so much to all of you who served. Okay, no other questions for, we have Dr. Shurtleff and Dr. Frost, any questions about Okay. okay. Ms. O'Connell, you went off. You go off mute? No, no, okay. <laughs> okay, Dr. Shirley. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have any particular questions. I just want to, um, <clears throat> Tony and I will need to talk uh, first thing in the morning. To, he, he will revise the schedule that he's been working on for the, okay. um, with his colleagues for January 19th uh, on the, uh, the district site visit Zoom meetings. Um, I, I believe that uh, there could only be a, uh, no more than two members of the school committee 
on those Zoom meetings or they become a, have to become a posted school committee meeting. Um, and I don't know who decides the time. I have indicated to the candidates that would be in the latter part of the, the afternoon so that it's um, uh, possibly convenient, but someone needs to decide, and, and I don't know whether that's here or with the chair, um, who meets on uh, at what time on uh, Monday and Tuesday. And the same thing for the interviews on the 26th. Um, who goes first, who goes second. Uh, there's the issue of whether or not the, those interviews would be broadcast live or whether they are recorded and then broadcast after the second interview so that theoretically no candidate has an advantage to hear the questions ahead of time. But mm -hmm. I just want to throw that out for, for, uh, for discussion. Okay. Um, Dr. Shurliff, in the past, when we had some meetings like this, um, what we did, and so this is just a proposal for folks to consider in terms of the various forums and which two school committee members apply, we did a like a sign up sheet. And then, you know, if there's more than two people interested, you know, we can just have a discussion about it. I think logistics, it's just logistics. So I don't think we need to do that in a public forum. Right. Um, if everyone's comfortable with that, we can kind of set that up tomorrow and figure out based on people's schedules. Does that, does that make sense for other members? Sure. Yeah. And then um, I think your point about recording um, and then sharing the interviews after the fact makes very good sense. Um, does anybody have any concerns or questions about handling the interviews on the 26th in that way? Oh, and, and the other thing to mention is that with uh, forums, um, Mr. Keedy has very kindly organized a QR code access to a survey for participants in the various forums so that school committee members can see the survey responses from the you know, staff members and students and community members and parents who participate and, and obtain that feedback from the... Um, from the candidates visits to the district. Yeah, and, thank you. you know, That's a good point. Along those same lines um, are the questions that um, Tony and, and uh, his colleagues have put together based upon, from what I, my reading, the, the superintendent profile comments, uh, are those good questions for you? Do you wanna to add to those questions at all in terms of feedback that you as individual members would like to hear from? because those were shared out uh, a few days ago, right? I'll have to have another look and then I can reply to that email. Yeah, everybody can feel free to give their feedback to directly to, to Ray. I just have a question about the final interviews. Are they live interviews? Are we gonna be in a room together? Are they Zoom interviews? I think, I mean, my preference would be live if we can manage that. I do think I we have to, I, I think we have to, at the same time, we do have to play it day by day to see what, what's going on. But um, so that would be the goal with the backup plan of Zoom if needed. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a question about the, um, the interviews, the uh, school committee interviews <clears throat> uh, in late January. So, um, we're going to be, am I understanding that we're going to have a list of questions that we're going to be asking and that those questions are going to be consistently asked for both candidates? Yeah, I, what's, so um, Dr. Shirtliff is going to post for us, um, how's this going to work? Is it a Google page or something where he's gonna have some suggested questions and then the questions that were asked by the screening committee. And then we all can provide feedback on like three to four questions that we prefer. And then um, we'll get down to a point probably of two questions per person. And we do need to ask the same questions in, in, both, inter in the, both interviews. So um, does that mean that, and Ray, you've got some, maybe you can speak to this, but you know, typically when I interview somebody, 
right? I ask questions and I get a response, then I'll ask a follow on question that's based on the response that I get. Do we not do that? Can we not do that? Um, I, I, it's not my decision, but I believe what we do, for example, with the screening committee is that you limit the follow up questions to the person who asked the question, uh, you know, and particularly focus on clarification. Um, I think that the critical piece is you need to decide how much time are you going to have for each interview. So let's say 10 questions, uh, five minutes a question for the respondent. Uh, you know, you're pretty close to an hour, some time left for the candidate to, to say something. Depends on how much time you want to allot. If you allot an hour and 15 minutes, then maybe there's a built in time for uh, follow up questions. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it. Is this a compliance thing? Is it a, and if it's a compliance thing, is it a Duxbury School Committee thing? Is it a, a law? Is it a state thing? That's what I don't understand. There's, there's no law. This is your decision in terms of how many questions you want, how open you want the, uh, the, the discussions. I think it's important to ask, obviously, as you mentioned, Matt, the, each candidate gets asked the same number of questions. The problem with follow-up is it's dependent upon what that person said. So you That's just right. need to build some time in and, and the chair uh, needs to um, just monitor that. Someone needs to monitor the time. Okay. Well, and, I'm and just asking it, now because if yeah. we're in this, you know, because yeah, I look at interviews as a, as a combination of not only asking, getting, asking questions and getting answers, but having a conversation to dig in. And I understand the time constraint. We, could, we should all be sensitive to that. But I just want to make sure I'm talking about it now because I don't want to, if, if I hear something and I ask a follow-up question, I just need to know whether that's even allowed. And so Shannon, maybe that's a question for you. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that it's more of like an HR hiring that you want it to be a fair process that everybody's being asked the same question. And that's why you try to stick to the clarifying questions only. I don't know if Tony has more to add from that perspective, but that's that's what I was told when we were doing the last superintendent search process. That was the feedback that I'd gotten is that it's it's about giving the candidates a fair playing field. No, you're, you're right, Shannon. You do want to kind of keep the questions consistent and to raise point, follow up question to clarify the point or get additional information is, is certainly good practice, but you do want to kind of the fundamental core questions to be consistent for both candidates. Okay, so Consistency on fundamental core questions, and we can ask for clarification or more detail if there's time to do that in the moment. Yes, the time really is probably going to become the issue. You yeah. know, with, like Ray said, with 10 questions, trying to budget an hour plus some time, you do want to be thoughtful about the time constraints. Yep. Do we need to de determine the length of the meetings now, the uh, interviews? Is that something we need to determine now while we're all here as a group? So you, yeah. you can yep. make your decision. Yep. yep, we can. Yep. Okay. Um, any strong preferences? I, I mean, I think an hour is a good amount of time, but if you guys. I agree with you, Shannon. Um, so it could be 45 minutes of questions and 15 minutes of opportunity for the candidate to ask questions or. We could do 45 minutes of questions and add 15 for the candidate because you want to you do want to make sure you leave time for the candidate to ask questions. Perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably maybe I'll probably just a minority in this, so I'll go with whatever the pleasure of the committee is. I would rather do 90 minutes and then have you know so that there's plenty of time for you know that sort of uh, you know a little bit of back and forth if it's necessary and to allow the candidate to. Um, you know, to give thoughtful responses. If it doesn't go the 90 minutes, it doesn't go the 90 minutes. But I would hate to, I would hate to not allow a lot of time and, and then sort of be on a clock so that we, you know, are feeling rushed. It's an important, important position. So personally, I don't think 90 minutes is unreasonable, but I'll go with whatever you guys think. So that the arrangement we had for the screening committee interviews was there was 90 minutes between the interviews. And that turned out to be a pretty good um, interval uh, because it allowed for some flexibility in the 
time with the candidate, but it, it also tended to give a few minutes to the members of the committee to kind of look over their notes and maybe add a few ideas or whatever, think a bit before going on to the next session. So maybe what I'm hearing is the kind of a rough target of an hour inner questions, 15 minutes question, uh, sorry. <laughs> An hour of the school committee asking questions, 15 minutes of the participant, and then a 15 minute kind of um, cushion so that there is some flexibility to go over. Because um, that, that is for a panelist interview, that's a pretty good and long amount of time. Um, it, right, um, Dr. Shirley and Dr. Frost, I welcome your thoughts since you've done um, many more of these than we have. Um, I suggested one. one hour and 15 minutes, because I think that an hour and a half could could be a little long. Uh, but um, I think that uh, there are other school committees, I'm aware, kind of set out an hour and a half, and they want to ask X number of questions and then get into a discussion, you know, and that discussion can't be necessarily equal, because you don't know what the topic's going to be. What I think you all are talking about is a set number of questions, some clarification, and asking the candidate to, to uh, uh, do you have any questions, etc. I, mm. I, I you know, don't know how that will play out, um, uh, but you may want some time to kind of uh, dialogue, if you will, uh, and, and be able to kind of do that and not not shut it off. You know, yeah. um, so you know, I think as, as Julia said, an hour and a half between uh, start times is, is helpful. George, you have you have more experience uh, as a superintendent than I do in terms of uh, that and, and applications, et cetera. What's your thoughts? Um, I, I really, I really like the idea of having uh, some opportunity for follow-up questions to be asked, but. Um, I believe limiting it to the, the person who asked the initial question and, and try and have them be as, as much for clarification of an answer as possible. Um, I, as Tony said, I, I think the, the critical element is that you, you make the, the two interviews as equitable and, and uh, equal in content as, as you possibly can. Um, and I, you know, I, I believe that um, you're going to have an opportunity uh, to see the candidates on the 19th, um, and uh, then, uh, you know, the the interviews on the 26th become your opportunity to pursue and follow up the the information that you need. Um, I, I think the goal of an hour with some cushion is probably the the best strategy to follow. Well, and it sounds like the 90 minute start time worked well for the screaming king. Matt, would that satisfy your concern of having a little bit of flexibility that we kind of aim for the hour 15 total and then with a 15 minute cushion in case things go over a bit? Sure. Is everybody else okay with that? Yes. Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay, so we're aim for questions by the school committee of an hour, so then we can kind of figure out how many questions we can fit in, and that'll just be logistical math, and then um, 15 minutes for questions from the candidate, and then knowing that we have some breathing room, but also that we want to break because you want to be able to kind of collate your thoughts about that interview before you go into the next one. So um, I have one other thought I want to kind of throw out there, two thoughts actually. Um, Shannon, um, I believe if you haven't already, you will send out an email to the school committee that gives them the Google Drive link for the school committee interview questions. Uh, yeah, I was going to do that after this meeting. Yes. Right. And, and yeah. so after this meeting, um, once I know you have received that Google Drive link, I will load up uh, the interview questions uh, are already in there. The screening committee questions are already in there. I would load up the two application folders. Uh, that has the same information that the um, screening committee saw last week. So I will load up those two applications. Uh, 
the memo that goes out tomorrow uh, on, on the website uh, will have two clean resumes, as I call them, the resumes that the screening committee saw minus any personal contact information. So those, those are public documents once you post them on the website. And, and the, the, the other point that um, I think you need to talk about a little bit is for the district site visit Zoom meeting, who do you want to meet? Traditionally, um, you know, it's, uh, I've often asked candidates, pull together some people that you uh, uh, can talk about you, talk about your accomplishments, successes, uh, challenges, um, and, and have them have that responsibility. Other times, you know, people want to meet with some teachers, they want to meet some parents, some community officials, uh, maybe students, I don't know. Uh, I think we've talked about having an hour and a half for that uh, Zoom meeting. Um, so um, what are your thoughts? On, on who you want to hear from. I think I remember, your suggestion, Ray. Yeah, I think that's, and I think we had talked about that at the last meeting, right? And I think we were all kind of leaning towards your suggestion of um, asking the candidates to provide who they thought we should talk to, because it would be an interesting reflection, right? right. That's what right. we talked about during the last meeting. Yeah, okay, that's good. And I have one more question. What is the role of our two student representatives in the interview process? Are they just allowed to go to that student um, block during January 19th? Are they involved in the interviews at all? I, I would be thrilled to have them as part of the interview. Okay, great. So I think we just need to allot them, you know, the kind of the question piece. Right. And there'll be part sure of the discussion also on the 27th. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's awesome. Yeah, because yeah, I mean the 27th is an it's an open meeting, so. Yeah. So regarding yeah. regarding the questions, uh, I want to pick up on something that I thought I heard Matt say. The there's a, a bank of questions, um, 60 or 70 questions that you can select from, but you can also craft your own question. You're not limited to to any of the questions in those in that bank. And so other student reps act, getting access to their Google Drive so they could to, uh, collect their questions or should they just send a question they might want to ask directly to me? Michael, do you have a, yeah, since Michael, since you're here, do you have a preference? Would you like to see the bank or do you want to come up with your own? Um, I'd love to just if, in any case that I have to like ask questions just so I'm not repeating anything. But yeah, I'm definitely willing to do whatever you need in the process. I'm sure Jake is as well. I so, think it would be a great experience for them to see the whole bank. Yeah. So they will see the whole bank plus they'll see that the full application folders. Awesome. Thank you. And just, it, just as, long to, as, you, as long as you don't have any concerns with that, yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a, here's my uh, thinking, and George helped me out on this. The public resume is a public document, et cetera. The application folders are, are not a, yet a public document. So that um, I, I, I think that it's problematic to have a non-school committee member look at the application folders, letters of references, et cetera. And I see Tony okay. nodding his head in agreement. Yeah, so what okay. we can do is we, we can easily um, um, create a Google Doc just for the students to use okay. uh, with the bank of questions and sort of the public records that are available to all and just limit access to that. That's that's pretty straightforward, easy to do. Thank yeah. you. Okay. That'd be great. And we'll talk about that tomorrow, Tony. Yep, we can yeah. handle that. Good. Good. Yep. Can I ask one clarifying question? I'm confused on the time on the 26th. Are we talking? So we've decided 75 minutes for the interviews, right? And then are they back to back or Julia had mentioned taking 90 minutes in between interviews so that we write notes? Or was that if we were gonna, I was confused on that. I think she only meant a few 15 minutes to take notes, et cetera. So, okay. That, you know, that, that's so the I mean. total time per candidate is 90 minutes. 
for example, uh, you need to decide what time the first uh, interview is, but just say for the sake of discussion, at six o'clock, the second uh, interview would begin at, at 7.30, uh, finish up at nine o'clock, right? So, okay, thank you. So is six o'clock the traditional starting time for these meetings? Is, is that when you wanna start the, the two interviews? And I, wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind starting at 5.30 if other people are, yeah, I was going to suggest that. I agree. By about 8.30, I'm going to start to go like this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then the, the night of decision, what time do you want to start? That can be 6. Is that too confusing? No. No, that's fine. <laughs> so January 26th at 5.30 and January 7th at 6 o'clock. Okay. And Tony, when we talk tomorrow morning, we, we will decide who uh, you may need to uh, let the candidates know about the ske their schedule on the 19th, since mm -hmm. you're right on top of that. Um, I could, uh, I will have a discussion with them about expectation for uh, the, the 24th and 25th um, and uh, let them know what time their interview is on the 27th. So for the 24th and 25th, do you want to do two in one day, uh, two in one afternoon, or do you want to do one on the 24th and one on the 25th? Um, we, well, so we need to figure out who's going to attend that, right? Because it can only be two school right. committee members, right? right? I mean, I think it might be, give people a little bit more flexibility if we do one and split them up between the two days. Um, but I think that I can do like a logistical email to folks and see, like kind of do a doodle for availability and interest. Right. Does, and then you can that, let me, you can and let, then I'll let you know. know. And I'll let the candidate know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that's all. George, anything else that I've missed? Uh, no, I, I, I did you. The only thing would be uh, what uh, this committee's uh, preference would be relative to our uh, involvement in the, uh, the general uh, reference checking. Well, good point, thanks. Um, my, my understanding from, from uh, my discussions with, uh, with Shannon is that uh, George and I will do the general reference checking, uh, following up with all the references that they gave us and, and uh, any other networking uh, references that we can do. And then the school committee needs to decide uh, how they're going to do their reference checking, for example, talking to people in the community, um, um, in this case, both Duxbury and, 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 and Weymouth, uh, and other school committee members that might have had some interaction with uh, both candidates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, town officials, et cetera. How do you want to handle that? Yeah, so for that piece, I think in the past, the chair has kind of sent out a list and, and just said, you know, each person take one or two, depending on what that list is. Um, so I, I need to work on that. And Ray, I might reach out to you for help in terms of building out the kind of slots, and then I will send it out to everybody and ask them to sign up, oh, because I think, yep. um, yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Tony, have we covered everything we need to cover in terms of information you need? Yes, sir. I think we're all set. And then uh, the, Shannon will communicate with you in terms of um, um, information that you need to know. A lot of information. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I gotta go make my own little to-do checklist. So, yeah. you know, yeah. if you don't hear from me yeah. in like 12 hours, come find me. <laughs> uh, I'm able all day tomorrow. I'm around whenever you need okay. me, Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is great, though. It's exciting. Uh, any any other questions from any of the committee members now? Okay, we're going to keep keep moving along. Uh, very That's exciting. Great. Very exciting. Thank you. Okay, I will move the two of you back to attendees. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Okay, and so our next uh, final discussion item is the fiscal year 23 budget hearing.
So who am I turning, who's running this one? Is it um, Ms. Blake? Yep, Ms. Blake is going to start and I'm just gonna put the presentation up. We have a few, just a few slides. There's not a, a whole presentation. Okay, great. So um, the number that we are recommending for approval tonight for the fiscal year 23 operating budget um, is shown on the screen in front of you here. It is a 4.02 percentage increase over fiscal year 22. Um, this number includes a 2.88% increase which represents um, the amount of money that will that it will take to cover our level services budget. And it also includes an additional 1.14%, um, or you can see the number here, an additional $437,600 uh, to fund a number of high priority budget additions. Um, as we've discussed at our previous meetings, our budget additions do um, exceed the number that was recommended uh, initially by the town manager and the town finance director to the board of selectmen back in December. Um, so in addition to the level services number, they had recommended an additional $275,000 um, for the school department. Um, but we do feel that our operating budget proposal is representative of what is in the best interest of the district as we look to move forward um, from the past several years of interrupted learning. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So this is just a summary of the fiscal year 23 budget additions um, that make up that $437,600. Um, you will note here, so all of these additions were presented to you uh, back in November. Um, we did eliminate two of the budget additions um, that were originally presented to um, try to uh, lessen the gap between the um, budget addition that we were proposing and the budget addition um, that we were made aware of. So the two, um, Original additions that are not on this list are the funding for the full, free full day kindergarten, um, as well as funding for the expansion of the operations and maintenance department. So that was a 1.0 uh, FTE overall that we were looking to add. Um, and so Dr. Klingman is going to re reiterate the justifications for each one of these positions um, in the following slides. Thank you, Katie. So as we had presented on November 3rd and then discussed again at our December meeting, um, we knew that our students were going to have some unique needs when they returned to school this year. And um, that certainly was the case when the school year started. Our adjustment counselors do a lot of um, really important work in our schools to support the social and emotional and mental health well-being of our students. And so some of the things that they do, uh, so we have two elementary schools, as you know, with 600 students approximately in each, and we have one adjustment counselor currently um, responsible for running all of the social groups, the anxiety groups, um, any of the special groups that we perform for students that may be having some social skills or other family changes and some of those challenging um, issues that they work with um, a small group of other students and the adjustment counselor. They're supporting SEL in every classroom. They're doing whole class lessons. They are helping any students that need daily check-ins and individual counseling sessions. They're consulting with all of our teachers, all of our, a lot of our parents um, re rely on them. So it's just gotten to be a position that is so key and essential, um, especially after we have returned from two very challenging years and continue to have a challenging year. So our recommendation was for the Chandler School and the Alden School to have an additional social worker or adjustment counselor, um, depending on the applicants and the certifications that we would see for that position. Um, we think that this is very important. 
heading into next school year. Um, we talked a little bit during my um, mid-year goals update about the need for support at the secondary level to, to really enhance our opportunity to provide students with extra help in real time before the students fall behind. And we wanna make sure that we're really um, maximizing the use of the academic support period. This is really the first year that the schedule has been more of a typical year, because as you could re can recall last year, we shortened class periods and had all of our classes meeting every single day. So this year is the um, first year that this new schedule has been in place. And we definitely have seen a need for increased support during that academic support period so that it's targeted and the students are getting help when they need it. So with the three math tutors, each grade level, six, seven, and eight would have the opportunity to receive small group support, general education support that would not be um, just for students on 504s or IEPs. This would be any general ed student or any student at all who needs some extra help during that academic support period would be able to be supported by these tutors, um, one at each grade level. We um, really see a great need for additional support of our middle school students in terms of another assistant principal. And I think that um, when the students returned from the interrupted year of learning and the, the um, end of the year, we did have all of our students back, but this year really um, was eye-opening in terms of our seeing the needs of our students and the amount of supervision and extra support and just proactive um, structured ways to make sure that we're um, supporting our students before things become an issue. And I think hallway behavior, cafeteria, making sure that we're um, really have an increased presence in the building so that we can head off any situations before they become an issue in terms of friendship issues, or if there's a child that's feeling unsafe because of just some conflicts they may be having. We really um, have seen a great need for this support at the middle school. And I want to correct something that was shared at the last meeting. Um, I, I read somewhere that said that we are looking for an additional assistant principal to increase the amount of teacher evaluation that we want to do at the middle school. And that's not the case. We have a really heavy um, expectation and workload of doing teacher evaluation in terms of the contractual obligations for a number of um, unannounced and announced visits that we're doing to classrooms and evaluations. We want to increase our presence to be able to go in classrooms, not in an evaluative manner, but to really look at the teaching and learning that's happening, look for trends and find ways that we can better support our teachers and students. Um, having an additional administrator to be able to do that at a, at a big middle school with six teams is really important. Um, and when we talk about intervention and really ut utilizing that academic support block more effectively, Having an additional assistant superintendent that could really be in charge of looking at our student needs, how our students are performing in their classes based on feedback from teachers to be able to proactively give kids some extra help before it becomes an issue where their grades maybe aren't where they should be. So we need someone to be able to progress monitor and look at our student data so that in real time, we can provide students with extra help and having that additional um, assistant principal at the school will, will really free up um, someone to be able to do that. Because right now, if there's one issue that goes on during the school day, it can really take up the time of Mrs. McGuire and Mrs. Coyne in a way that it doesn't allow the administrator to be able to be present in the classrooms as much as they would really choose to be and in the hallways and the team areas and being able to be that presence. And so uh, if you have any more questions at the end about that assistant principal position, I'd be glad to answer them. The next um, additions we're recommending the um, increase to the full-time equivalency for these teachers would be um, teachers that are currently not working full-time 1.0. We would like to take a look at who those teachers may be and if there's an interest for them to increase their full-time equivalency to be able to support those academic support blocks at the high school. We feel as though that would be um, great use of their time and it would greatly impact the student's ability to get extra help in whatever course they may need extra help in. So that would be the increases to the FTE for humanities or math and to the world language. But the computer science teacher increase, um, we had budgeted 0.6, um, I think two years ago um, for a computer science teacher to be able to enhance our um, instruction in the STEM area. Um, as you may remember us talking about in previous um, school committee meetings, we've had computer science offerings that have been self-directed 
by the student and just proctored by a teacher. And we really feel as though we need a certified computer science teacher to be able to enhance our programming at the high school in terms of computer science programming, um, just additional um, classes in the STEM area that we know a lot of other schools offer that really are important for students going into the, um, the sciences and to STEM careers and even engineering courses. So we'd like to um, be able to hire the highest qualified candidate we can. And we've, we've had a very difficult time hiring a part-time teacher that's qualified in that area. It's really important to us. And I think we um, had the last recommendation was to increase our English as a second language staff. So currently we have one um, full-time English as a second language teacher ESL at the elementary level that supports all of our Alden and Chandler students who are our English learners. And we have one teacher right now that's 0.6 at the secondary level. And they're both fantastic, wonderful teachers working so hard to um, be able to get our students that are English learners. Um, we wanna make sure that we're providing instruction so that's allowing them to be able to progress on the access testing so that they're no longer requiring these services and they're able to access their learning. And so we have seen an increase in our number of English learners that are in district. And it's really important that we provide them with the, um, the services services that they require based on their access testing levels, which we have requirements by the state that we need to make sure we're adhering to. And I think that is all for the, um, so Kate, we probably should wait to get into the capital um, request unless, did you wanna stop here for now and have see if there's any questions about the operating budget? Yeah, that makes sense. Any questions? So just to clarify, the, um, the increases to existing FTE at the high school, those are all existing staff members increasing their teaching load? That is correct. It would be no, no new hires as current staff members. Got it, thank you. So, but you just said the computer science teacher, you've had a hard time filling. So that person will go to full time and it would or it could potentially be a different person. That is a position that has remained unfilled. Um, and we've been working with this position since we started the pandemic and we've entered um, that period of challenging hiring time. So that position has been budgeted for, but hasn't been filled so far because of our lack of um, ability to hire a certified candidate. Got it. And then this is probably a super ignorant question, but the um, just about the English as a second language teacher, how are those people equipped to deal with all the different languages that kids come in with? It's um, it's really interesting to see. They work with students in small groups based on their um, access level. And so if there are students working at a, a similar level of their English proficiency, they may be grouped together. There are times when students are seen one-on-one -on -one if there's not other students that are at a similar level to them. But their instruction is mainly in English when they're in that those sessions. They're not they're not speaking in their native language. But often the students that are in our English learners um, programs love sharing their language with their with the other students and with the teacher. So I think the teacher is always learning words and vocabulary in the in their original um, native language along with their English instruction. So all the instruction is in English, and we have to make sure that we're equipping our teachers um, and our families with um, resources, dictionary if we're if we're really at the beginning stages of communication so we use translators um, when we need to in terms of parent conferences or even when we're working with registration of families who may be in, limited in their ability to communicate in English. Um, but it's a wonderful program and we have students that enter our, especially at the elementary school this year with no English and it's an absolutely incredible thing to witness as an educator to see how quickly our students pick up English and how motivated they are to learn. Um, so it's wonderful. I'm always jealous when teachers get a student who's a new English learner because the growth is incredible from when they start and week by week, you can just see the vocabulary growing. So that's how they, they make it work with all different base languages. Do you feel like it, um, the $33,000 for the math or the reader reading tutors is enough of a salary to attract qualified candidates that you'll be able to fill those much needed positions? I think we will. It's an appealing position. It's a little bit different than a teaching assistant. So the um, pay rate would be slightly higher and it would be 
as the, um, similar to the way we hire our elementary math tutors. And we do have elementary math tutors that are certified teachers that are looking for that type of position. So I, I do believe by um, having the position structured in the same way that we have the math tutors, we will be able to hire um, qualified candidates. And I think with the assistant principal really serving as someone overseeing the um, intervention program, I think they'll have the support and the um, that they need to be able to be successful. So I, I do think we'll be able to hire those positions at that rate. Okay. I still have my reservations about the assistant principal position because I do just have concerns about another administrative position where I feel like our teachers have, and not saying that you guys have not, but our teachers have really received the brunt of what is going on. So I just want to make sure that they feel supported by this position. Um, and I know you've reinforced that well at our last meeting. Um, but I really hope that it's a position that supports our teachers and is used to help them be successful in their classrooms. So yeah. I'm really I'm really glad you brought that up at the last meeting because I think that's a natural question people may have. But I think it's always a good reminder that at the middle school level, if for us to add one teacher, because it's team based, it wouldn't impact the number of students that we would want to be able to um, have a position like that impact. And so we think that the biggest um, impact that we can have would be an administrator that's really there to support all teachers. And so I think that um, at times our, our administrators are very, um, they're busy and they're doing the best they can to meet needs, but that presence, that daily presence on team areas and to be able to check in with teachers throughout the day is so important to support them. And if they're having an issue or difficulty with a student or a tricky conversation that they need to have with someone, having that administrative support and having that administrator really overseeing our intervention program, we feel as though we'll have the greatest impact on all students. Um, rather than if we were to add one teacher, it would be difficult to determine who would be able to benefit from what groups of students would be able to get that support. And it, like I said, there's not extra classroom space to be able to make smaller class size. At the middle school, the way the teams are set up, it's really all the um, classroom spaces are being utilized and the team areas right now. Um, and I think this year, it, uh, not just in theory, but in practice at the middle school, we've had Mrs. Coyne out and she's the assistant principal. And so we've had two guidance, well, we've had a guidance counselor and a social studies um, curriculum head covering the position. And they've had to be taken from their positions. Like I know Lisa's still doing guidance and Lou's still doing social studies. So that's just um, a real life example. And that middle school is unbelievably busy. I know all the schools are, but that age group of kids is so vulnerable to so many different aspects, socially, emotionally, and academically. Um, that's why I'm fully in support of that position. Okay, if, if we can always come back to questions um, about the operating budget generally. And if um, I think we just wanted, Katie just wanted to be able to go over um, the capital request because I believe we'll, um, you'll be voting on both budgets this evening. And so uh, Mrs. Blake, sorry to um, not call you Mrs. Blake, but would you like to go over the um, capital briefly? Sure, and I will um, just review it just briefly. Um, there are no changes to the fiscal year 23 capital budget um, since we originally proposed it back in October. I believe that all of our recommended um, capital projects and capital equipment um, have also been approved um, to be put on the warrant for town meeting. Um, so you can see here the um, capital budget requests include some instrument replacement, furniture replacement, the athletic complex upgrade, um, phone system, and then the access point replacement, which is a, a multi-year um, project. So the total number is over a million dollars. It's a significant expense, um, but we do, we also had a large surplus from fiscal year 21 that we were able to um, turn back to the town. So we um, believe that that this is a reasonable request for fiscal year 23.
Any questions? Looks good to me for this one. I'll stop sharing my screen unless you wanted to have the um, overall number visible. That would help. So yeah. it's the 40,044,916. That's what we're voting on. That's correct. And what's the, and what's the capital total again? 1 million. 86,710. $86, okay. Okay. Do we, do we have any more questions on, on the operating or capital budget? No, okay. So then that closes that discussion. And um, we now move to public comment. Um, the comments from the public section of the meeting uh, is an opportunity, hold on two seconds, I've got it this time, for members of the community to address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative matters, or share ideas about how we can work together to improve the Duxbury Public Schools. We value your input and respect divergent views. We only ask that you limit your remarks to three minutes and refrain from airing grievances with individual members of the school committee. So again, three minutes and be kind. And if you just put your hands up, if anybody wants to be brought in to make a statement. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands yet. So then we will move on to the next item, which is we have one action item tonight, which is to a vote to approve the fiscal year 23 budget. I guess we're gonna probably do two separate votes, one for the operating budget and one for the capital budget. Um, so again, for the operating budget, um, it's recommended that we approve a budget of $40,044,916 dollars and for the operating budget, $1,086,710. Okay. Um, if there are any questions or if not, can I have a, a motion? Do, do, is that okay? I think we'd, we'll just do a motion for the operating and a motion for the capital. Does that make the most sense to set both them separately? Yeah, good. Okay, so can I have a motion to approve the recommended uh, operating budget, please? Motion to approve the operating budget of forty million forty four thousand nine hundred sixteen dollars. Second. Okay. Uh, do roll call. Julia. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Matt. Nay. Kristen. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Vote carries four to one. Then we have the uh, capital budget. Um, do we have a motion to approve the 1,086,710? I move that we approve a capital budget of $1,086,710 for fiscal just, 23. Okay. We just lost Kelly. Um, does anybody want a second that? Second. Okay. We'll do a roll call and I'll do it really slowly in hopes that she will call back in. Julia. Aye. Matt. Aye. Kristen. <laughs> aye. Shannon, aye. I don't know if we just wanna, I mean, it's a, I could just do, I guess, a four zero vote approved. And then if she dials back in, we can add her to the number if I do the roll call when she joins. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, okay. So anyway, so both both budgets um, approved. Um, and that is it. Our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, February 9th. But that actually needs to be updated because we will have a public meeting on um, January 26th and January 27th. So that needs to be updated. There it is. Kelly, before I close out, would you like to, we had a motion and a second for the um, capital budget. 
Would you like to do a roll call for that? We have any bandwidth issues, I think. There she is. <laughs> Sorry, my other laptop kicked me out. So I came in on this one and then I couldn't hear you. Uh, no problem. So we did, um, there was Capitol. a motion and second on the Capitol and, and, okay. and I, okay. So it's a five to zero approval of the Capitol budget. Okay, sorry about that. No problem, thank you. And then I was just saying the current tonight's agenda has the wrong date for our next meeting. Our regular, next regular meeting will be February 9th but we will have the um, uh, meetings on the 26th and the 27th as well as those other related um, superintendent search meetings uh, the week before. So with that, uh, I guess we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Roll call again, Julia. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Matt. Aye. Kristen. Aye. And Shannon. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Hope you all have a good night. Thank you. All right. Everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.